Colonel Melroy, Pam, Deputy Director of NASA. Um, I had the honor to work with you a bit when we were at DARPA together. Uh, you were literally the first uh, office director I met outside of I2O, uh, which was the cyber office in DARPA uh, where I worked. Um, I was very interested in space and I wanted to talk to somebody who knew space um, because I thought it would be good to think about cybersecurity in space systems. And uh, it turns out, um, you know, that it is very important. So it's great to talk to you again about cybersecurity. And um, I wanted to kind of kick this off uh, and get your background uh, and start all the way back, you know, when you, when you were a kid, uh, when did you get the bug for space? Uh, and tell us about your exciting path uh, to become Deputy Administrator of NASA. Well, it's great to see you, Frank. I vividly remember that conversation and uh, many other subsequent, and it was wonderful working with you at DARPA. And I was excited that you were interested in, in space and cyber because I think it's incredibly important. Um, I was bit by the space bug uh, during the Apollo program. It was uh, watching the Apollo astronauts step foot on the moon that inspired me. I know it wasn't just me, it's a whole generation of astronauts, engineers and scientists were inspired by Apollo. So uh, even though women were not a part of the astronaut program during Apollo, I just took a look at it and said, hey, you know, what does it take to be an astronaut? Um, at the time, they were all military jet test pilots. So that's what I decided to do as well. And I was fortunate that the opportunity started to open up ahead of me in high school and college. So uh, I did exactly that. I went into the Air Force, became a pilot and eventually a test pilot, and then uh, was selected as an astronaut. I flew three times in space and it was amazing, but I felt that there was more to learn out there and mountains to climb. And so I had the opportunity to go out to industry for a while. I also worked at the FAA, which is the regulator for commercial space industry. And, um, but then as, as you know very well, when you get the phone call to come to DARPA, that's not something you say no to either. So um, it's, it's been a great journey and I was just uh, very blessed to get a phone call asking um, me to be a part of the Biden-Harris administration as the deputy administrator of NASA. So the journey continues. That's, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I I'm honored to be able to talk to you again. And uh, I feel blessed too, just to be involved in, in any kind of space related thing. Um, I just find it super interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, your work at the FAA uh, in the commercial industry, and that sort of segues into our, our next uh, topic here. Um, so NASA is known for its leadership uh, and investment in high-risk technology, uh, which in many cases uh, matures and becomes a mainstream commercial item. I always joke and tell people uh, Tang Instant Breakfast, breakfast Drink uh, was a, uh, a food study that NASA did with, I think, John Glenn. Uh, he actually um, was, uh, was drinking Tang on his first flight. Um, but you know, obviously, there's there's more uh, commercial items than that that, that, have, that have been matured uh, by by NASA and other research organizations. Um, what are some of the capabilities uh, in the collection of technologies that NASA will rely on for the Moon and Mars missions? And of those capabilities, you know, those capabilities being uh, legacy NASA investments that are now in the commercial world, um, how will NASA leverage that economy of scale? Uh, in the mature manufacturing processes, and in what areas uh, will NASA rely upon the commercial sector uh, to get us back to the moon, Mars, and, and other places in space? Yeah, I had the opportunity, Frank, when I was at the FAA to see what the commercial world was doing. And what astounded me was how much they were taking technologies that had been developed by the U.S. government, both NASA and DOD particularly in the area of uh, rocket technologies. And we're making them more efficient, uh, doing what commercial industry does best. That investment, I think, in those technologies is really what spurred uh, the commercial space industry growth here in the United States. And now it's the envy of the world. So those tech investments um, did, in fact, come around uh, just like we all hoped and become commercial. What it means to NASA though, is that we now have a lot more ways to accomplish our goals. So we can make a decision about uh, putting together an architecture and ask ourselves what pieces make sense to be commercial. 
And um, of course, a great example is the commercial cargo and commercial crew program for the International Space Station. Uh, we estimated that rather than developing our own new vehicle, it saved us billions of dollars to partner instead with industry. And now that savings can be applied to the next step. And I like to say that NASA is the engine for commercial space, but you got to feed the engine and the fuel is that exploration, that pushing the boundaries and pushing the limits. And that's exactly what we're doing now with the Artemis program and Moon to Mars. It's so exciting uh, to think, you know, that we're really serious about, you know, getting back to the moon, getting back to Mars, the activity in cislunar um, and leveraging all those great commercial technologies. Um, you know, again, a lot of that stuff came from NASA, came from uh, organizations like DARPA, um, and uh, and we're seeing it today. Um, and a great segue into our, our next topic, the new space environment. Um, so the barrier to entry uh, for access to space uh, has been lowered significantly in the past decade, like, like you were just saying. Uh, companies like SpaceX uh, ha have helped reduce launch costs uh, and increase the launch tempo, uh, which shifts resources to uh, lower costs for satellite development uh, and other applications that go on those satellites. Um, last January, I think there was 143 satellites launched on the Transporter 1 mission at one time. That's crazy. Um, so this democratization of space brings with it a fantastic future, uh, but also makes people like me uh, uh, concerned about cybersecurity. Um, so with the Hackasat program, we're trying to get ahead of those potential issues in space and cyber by bringing together the best hackers and aerospace engineers in the world to identify these pitfalls and tell us how to avoid them and how to mitigate them, how to make better products. Um, NASA is clearly supportive um, and has done some interesting work uh, to help build in security from day one. What can we learn more about what NASA is doing in the cybersecurity space and how can we share it with the rest of the community? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, a lot of our cybersecurity has been built in from the beginning, um, mostly because of, not because of hackers, but the idea that you would have people on the ground who would be sending commands to spacecraft with humans on board who might actually be sleeping or doing something else. And so just the, the simple steps of making sure that uh, that you're checking to make sure that the correct commands are being sent, that there's nothing being sent in error. Of course, the concerns of cyber have added a layer of security um, that have ha ha has had to be built in uh, because if there was ever an intrusion, for example, of the network where mission control is located, um, that would be that would be just as bad. And so uh, we've had to build fence lines uh, further and further out. I think, um, you know, when I was at DARPA, uh, I wanted I wanted someone to just give me a checklist that we could incorporate into design principles. We are so not there yet. I mean, it would be good if we had it. Uh, but in fact, you just have to start with the, that that idea. And uh, people like you and the other program managers, uh, when we were at DARPA together, working on secure kernels, working on um, on, on other approaches to cybersecurity. Uh, I mean, the, the, the great thing is uh, transition is, is fast when it's such an urgent need, right? There's a huge pull for it. Um, I, think, I think we still have a ways to go uh, to come up with any sort of magic silver bullet to just say, yep, we're done. You know, we, we you know, designed it in and we're all good to go. I think we all need to be continually working together and evolving. But I will say that I really think that the right uh, plan is to get to a point where uh, you are using the speed of cyber as a defensive mechanism, because increasingly uh, the speed of hacking is, is getting to the point where it's at the speed of electrons. So our defense has to keep up with it. No, that's, that's a really good point. And um, you said a couple things there that really resonated with me is that, number one, you realize that we're not there yet. Um, I've, I've heard in other places people think we're very close. Me, I don't think we're, we're that close. And I, and I think it's, it's very wise of you to realize that and say we need to still you know, continue working hard uh, to secure our systems 
and there is no magic bullet. And so it takes a team uh, to help secure uh, our systems together and keep working towards that uh, goal uh, to have really good secure systems. Um, so now let's kind of shift gears into something uh, a little bit uh, not as scary. Um, I want to talk a little bit about education and STEM and other opportunities uh, at universities and high schools. So clearly space is a hot topic these days. Uh, you know, space has energized thousands and thousands of, of kids uh, with all of the great stuff that they're seeing on YouTube. A lot of space launches are now broadcast live on YouTube and other, other uh, social media forums. So you can actually see satellites being deployed in space. You can see spacewalks happening in real time on the NASA channel. Just amazing. Um, one, one point I wanted to, to talk about just real quick is, is I was reading about this high school uh, in Irvine, California. Um, and they have built uh, three CubeSats that demonstrate electric propulsion systems. So we've gone from, you know, in the 50s and 60s from model rocketry clubs to now we have CubeSat clubs uh, in high schools. So um, it, it, again, Hackasat is sort of bridging the gap between the passion for space and the passion for cybersecurity in the academic community. Um, do you foresee a place uh, for NASA to promote both space and cyber at an even younger age and establish this solid foundation uh, for cybersecurity as we nurture these young minds in space? I think there is a place for that. I, I am really heartened by the work that I see uh, at uh, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, to try to do exactly that, to bring to bring cyber into the tent and make it a part of um, their communication strategy. And uh, those professional organizations and societies have a huge influence on the students of today. I mean, they bring people together, they uh, bring topics up in conferences, um, they send out mailing information. I think, um, you know, this seems to be a trend. You know, there seems to be some interest at universities in trying to uh, trying to converge these areas. And uh, I think it's absolutely through challenges and uh, communications. I think NASA can absolutely play a role in, in bringing those things together. I mean, the fascinating thing about space is, as you pointed out, the breadth of activities that are going on. So it's not enough to say you're just interested in space anymore. It's like, well, what kind of space? What, what right. would you, what's your discipline? It's a little bit like saying you like engineering. Well, no, you, you need to take the next step and and uh, and hopefully we'll get some, uh, this next generation will bring us those cybersecurity professionals that we really need in the industry and they'll make breakthroughs in research that will help us be safer. That's really great. Um, so let's move on to our next topic, uh, talking about uh, cybersecurity risks and commercial applications. Um, so commercial applications uh, that NASA will rely on for the Moon and Mars missions and other uh, space, space exploration activities have proven themselves uh, for survivability in space over the, over the past years, uh, and they're being used today. So how is NASA helping the commercial industry apply that same rigor uh, that went into the original design of those, those communications capabilities and other commercial uh, applications, uh, applying that same rigor to cybersecurity? like you talked about, you have sort of this, this fence that keeps growing outward to make for a more robust system. Um, knowing that requirements alone uh, do not make things secure. Um, another point uh, that kind of goes along with that is that it's not just about malicious actors trying to break into systems. When you apply adversarial thinking to your own systems, you're actually improving the quality of software overall. And so that um, you minimize the number of mistakes that can happen for simple things that you thought had been solved a long time ago, like orbit calculations or timing or clocks that aren't synchronized properly. So it's not just about malicious actors. Um, and, um, and with Hackasat, we, we do bring that adversary into the picture to help stress test technologies from the cyber perspective. Although there's no requirement uh, to bring friendly adversaries into the testing process, um, at, at scale that we've seen. Um, is this something you think industry should start to implement, not only to prevent malicious hackers, but also to improve the quality of software overall? Well, you know, it's interesting. In some ways they already are, and I'll give you an example. 
uh, it's probably easy to assume that uh, the government is leaning forward and is, you know, the biggest risk and the biggest threat from a cybersecurity because uh, people are wanting to hack us for the information that we have and the things that we do. But in fact, if you go out to, for example, the commercial telecommunications industry, they are beaming television and other capabilities around the world. And believe me, they are huge targets and they uh, have managed to figure out how to defend and beat off um, thousands of cyber attacks a day, not just from people who are trying to say, hack in and get a free channel, but in some cases, actually saying, well, I don't like the content that you're beaming into my country, therefore I'm going to try to prevent you uh, from downlinking anything. So I think they're, um, you know, just the same way we realize that uh, major uh, providers, both of internet and also uh, just sort of um, leading edge software companies like Microsoft and Google uh, are, are also, I mean, they're commercial, but they are absolutely right out there at the bleeding edge as well. I think the harder is a more traditional industry, or perhaps some of the um, some of the companies that you know you've mentioned, high school CubeSat clubs, right? But um, you know you can just see uh, a bright-eyed entrepreneur who's excited <laughs> about space, not even thinking twice about cyber, right? So that's that's where we really really have to worry about it. We've got to do better about defining you know cyber hygiene practices. But I think uh, the interesting thing is that this is um, this is going to become an issue for those companies. And I'll give you one example, denial of service. So SpaceX is putting out internet capability around the world through their Starlink mega constellation. Um, boy, if they're not thinking about denial of service as an internet provider, um, they're gonna have to do that pretty fast. They're gonna have to have to figure that out. Um, it, you're right that you can't um, make requirements, but uh, the, the truth is it's, it is on the government when we're procuring services uh, to be smart in our, in our own right and make sure that we're putting the requirements in uh, for the companies to at least think about it up front and then checking and using all the tools at our disposal uh, to try to help them figure out how to be safe going forward. What I think is going to be interesting is uh, if they haven't woken up to it yet, they're going to have to wake up pretty fast. No, uh, you're 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 so very right. Um, and I, I think in the in the Starlink uh, case, I think um, it's actually uh, an incentive, like a very strong incentive, to make sure that those new modern communication systems uh, for uh, proliferated low Earth orbit uh, constellations. Um, those are going to be providing a money-making service, uh, right? And so they're they're definitely going to uh, want to put that at the at the very top of their list to make sure those systems are up uh, and robust. Um, okay, so so last topic. Um, this is kind of a an edgy one: autonomy uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, so having spent time at DARPA, um, you're definitely familiar with the the grand challenge um, uh, and investments in autonomous self-driving cars. We also had the Cyber Grand Challenge too, which was an autonomous uh, cyber system. So that was uh, the original Grand Challenge was about 15 years ago. Uh, and we're seeing amazing commercial implementations uh, of that on our roads today. In fact, I think some cars are capable of complete autonomy, uh, but just through a, a, a software switch, they don't allow it quite yet because it's not cleared the, the sort of legal frameworks. Um, so years and years and years ago, NASA was literally a pioneer in autonomous vehicles, you know, starting uh, back with the early space probes like Pioneer, uh, which is probably more of an expert system than fully autonomous, but, but still, it's out there still, I think, in, in Voyager 2. Um, there are some cyber risks and AI frameworks, artificial intelligence frameworks, uh, regarding incomplete modeling of the environment that they're in, um, and also malicious actors taking advantage of those potential vulnerabilities and incomplete models. There's a, there's a famous story of, of some uh, researchers uh, who were able to modify a stop sign uh, where they put uh, a piece of black tape on a stop sign and the autonomous system completely misrecognized it and, and, and drove right through. Um, so this seems like it's another area where industry can really help by sharing their experiences from terrestrial autonomy uh, and security for application in space systems in partnership with industry. Um, what is NASA looking at to ensure fault tolerant autonomy for future missions involving 
really cool things like in orbit refueling, space junk recovery, um, autonomous moon Mars outposts, asteroid mining, all those different types of really cool applications where we can't put humans, you know, in that situation, but we would want, you know, autonomous vehicles to be to be able to do that. Oh, I think NASA has been a leader in this area. I mean, if you stop and think about the rovers, uh, those, that's autonomous driving. I mean, the commands are, the path is set the night before or the day before, but then it's all executed uh, autonomously. So I think we've learned a lot from our rovers on Mars uh, about path planning, uh, you know, sort of at the cutting edge of machine vision uh, for navigation purposes and things like that. You know, it, it, it is interesting. I mean, my framework around autonomy says that space is actually the easiest environment for autonomy uh, because you don't have any curbs, <laughs> roads you have to follow, right? So it's it's actually a very simple environment. And then the next most complex would be air. Uh, and you still have to worry about takeoff and landing. Uh, and then, um, you know, maritime. Uh, two-dimensional problem or maybe a three-dimensional problem for um, underwater vehicles uh, but ground is actually the hardest I mean it really is uh, self-driving cars it is the hardest problem in autonomy because of the complexity of the environment and the rules around that so um, as long as you're following Kepler's rules uh, in space <laughs> Um, you're going to stay on the road and you won't hit the curb, right? Because, because um, that's just the physics of it. Um, but, you know, it is uh, incredibly important for things that we haven't really thought about. And I think it's actually, um, you know, all the things that we do, especially in deep space, do require high levels of autonomy. But what we have to worry about, again, going back to this, it's, it's the outer layers. It's, well, did we... I mean, it's astounding to me now, but so many satellites were not set up with encrypted uplink and downlink mm. commands. I mean, that's astonishing. So those are the basics that we need to be looking at. Uh, I think now ground ground stations in general um, seem to me to be one of the highest risks uh, going forward. It is true we're going to have some challenges on the moon. Uh, we do need a much higher level of autonomy. I've visualized things like rover assistants to our astronauts, both on the moon and in the future on Mars, who are the ones who are going out and finding the really interesting science or maybe even fetching, you know, samples back from wow. the most interesting places so uh, that, the, the, you know, the crew can can do that higher order thinking on multiple strands that's so hard for machine learning right now. You can optimize around a single question but only a human can optimize around 10 questions at once. And uh, so I think that, that um, to me, the future is of challenges in space is around human machine teaming, uh, that trust uh, and, and so forth. And so I think we, you know, we have a pretty good handle on full autonomy. It's, it's this partial. And, and I think actually the self-driving car world is finding that out too. That, that is probably some of the coolest, most exciting um, stream of thoughts that I, I've heard in a while uh, about the, the, the human machine partnership uh, on Mars that you were just talking about. Super interesting. In fact, I, I just watched The Martian uh, the other day with my kids. And so I'm, I'm all fired up again about that sort of thing. Um, so um, the, the, other, the other thing I wanted to mention this too is we, I talked about Pioneer just for a second there and Voyager. So Voyager, I think, is still operational. It's it's past the heliosphere. Um, I, I don't know if if that has dawned on a lot of people what that means. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you real quick, what like tell us tell us about the significance of that uh, for for that spacecraft to be so far out in in deep space. Well, the, being outside the heliosphere means essentially that you are outside the area of influence from the sun. So you're far enough away that, uh, you know, essentially it's a diff highly diffuse vacuum. You're not being affected by things like solar winds uh, or by gravity and uh, of the, from the sun. And uh, that's so fascinating. I mean, boy, talk about deep space. I, I think we uh, can barely even fathom it. The exciting thing 
is that Voyager is still taking data and sending signals back. And actually one of my favorite places at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is an artistic rendition of what's happening real time with communications coming in from the deep space network. So uh, it's, you know, a series of pipes that have lights that show that are correlated to the number of bits that are coming wow. from the spacecraft. And so, you know, you'll see something like Perseverance Rover and it's this blaze of light going up and down. And then it'll say Voyager is speaking and there will be tiny little, <laughs> little <laughs> tiny pulses. Because, you know, of course that's a, an, a really old system and uh, the capability uh, is extremely low. It's in bits per second, as I, as I understand it. Um, but it's priceless data, right? It's out from beyond anywhere that we've ever been. And I, I, I think uh, still has the potential to tell us about the formation of the universe by telling us what's in between those huge gaps between stars. Uh, but I just, I just love it when I see those little lights lighting up, telling us that we're talking, an incalculably far distant distance, uh, talking to Voyager, and it's speaking back with little tiny bits, but it's still priceless information. Yeah, I, I just had to ask you for your thoughts on that because I too am just, you know, floored every time I think about the distances uh, there. Okay, so we're gonna. Uh, Close it up here. Um, so what's next for, for NASA in space? So as we close, I think everyone is very interested to know what is at the top of the list in terms of priorities involving Moon, Mars, the James Webb is about to launch. I'm very excited to see uh, what, what that uh, provides us in terms of research. Um, other planetary missions and uh, interstellar missions potentially, um, since we've got Voyager so far out there. Um, so how can people learn more and what they, what can they do to get into space, uh, into a space profession, knowing that there's all sorts of different domains now in space and become part of this amazing culture to help drive us forward? Yeah, the, the, NASA is an amazing place and I can't even begin to describe the breadth of activities that we do. I find that the intersections are the ones that really excite me, the places uh, where there are seams. And an example of that is the seam between science and engineering. The engineering that's required to build something like the James Webb Telescope or the Perseverance Rover. And the science that drives it, how do you know what the most important and exciting science that you're trying to achieve is? The seam between air and space is hypersonics, right? That's an area that's really fascinating to me. We are doing so much, but of course, um, a lot of the inspiration comes from deep space exploration, not just our scientific exploration, but our human exploration. And of course we do the scientific exploration to tell us where the most exciting places in the future to send humans. An example of that is the Perseverance Rover is at the Jezero Crater on Mars, which was uh, took a long time to figure out, but a lot of people believe it is the most likely place for life to have existed on Mars in the past. We know there was water on Mars. We know it was flowing. And those are the places that we're interested in. And so we need that robotic exploration. Uh, we're gonna take some samples at the Jezero Crater, bring it back in the early thirties. And that is absolutely going to guide what we do in the future. And hopefully in about 20 years, we'll be ready to send humans. But we have to practice first. It's pretty complicated undertaking. We need a blueprint for how we're gonna do science with humans on other planets. And that means, of course, the technologies to keep humans alive and transport them to and from. But we also need to really think about what is the paradigm for doing science on the surface of another planet. For Apollo, we had sort of a long stick with a scooper on the bottom of it and a bag. And the astronauts scooped rocks up they were trained to look for the interesting ones, absolutely, put it in the bag and bring it home. Well, maybe we won't be doing that. Maybe we'll be using human machine teaming like I talked about earlier. Maybe we'll be using virtual reality from really high resolution, high definition uh, imagery of, of other planets and, and in deep space. And I think we need to just, I mean, we have a lot of work to do to figure that out. And to me, that's what's exciting. And that's what I'm focused on right now is 
actually building out that architecture and that plan to get from the moon to Mars and continue our exploration of the solar system further, both robotically and human. Pam, it's been a, a complete honor uh, to be able to talk to you again as Deputy Director of NASA, where you, where you sit today. Um, and I've enjoyed kind of keeping track of where you've gone and uh, it's uh, it's going to be great, I think, for everybody to hear uh, your thoughts that we just uh, um, you know spoke about all these different topics, and uh, and we hope uh, to see you again. Uh, and uh, if we do hack set three, which I'm I'm sure we're going to do, uh, and uh, and keep in touch. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Frank. I'm keeping my eye on you too, and I okay. <laughs> thank you very much for bringing your cyber expertise to the aerospace community. Absolutely. Until next time. Next time. <laughs>